Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, thank you. My name is Hilda. I am an alcoholic, and uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and thank you, Darren, uh, for your six and seven, and um, thank you, oh, Linda and Dawn and Eileen and the committee and anybody else who had a part in uh, having me uh, talk at this. I, um, I was looking forward to going to Bellingham, actually, um, so I'm, I'm a little annoyed that we're on, on Zoom, but... Uh, I guess that's been the way it is. Um, and I didn't realize I was going to be traveling yesterday. So uh, unfortunately, I got to, to miss some of my favorite people. Um, and yes, I'm going to say it, especially Larsine, my favorite Al-Anon. Um, we have to, we have to, you know. Um, but uh, I hadn't heard you before, Darren. So I'm, I'm glad I got to hear you. And uh, I'm glad it was you doing six and seven. Although I am a great six and seven fan, I will tell you. Um, my sobriety date is the 20th of July, 1993. I have a sponsor and she has a sponsor and I sponsor. And, uh, and I don't know if it gets any better than that. Um, I do have a home group. It's the Pacific Group in Los Angeles that has been on Zoom since, I guess, March now. Um, I'm looking forward to going back to the room soon as well. Um, and uh, I guess a bit like Darren... Um, alluded to or even said and and I know um I've heard Carla say it before as well that uh I will tell you a little bit of why I'm here um because if you don't identify with what I have you're not going to be all that interested in what my solution is right um and uh, and I love it when uh, when Carla says that because it makes all the sense in the world you know rather than having a speaker say oh I don't want to talk about my drinking because everybody knows about drinking it's like well yeah, but how do I know you had what I have? And why would I listen to you? You know what I mean? So um, so I will talk a little bit about my drinking. And, and also, it'll make sense as to why um, I am really one of those people who had to do eight and nine. Um, I am, let's see, I was, I was born in London. Um, I grew up and I'm an only child. And uh, only children uh, are used to entertaining ourselves. It's what we do. You know, we we entertain ourselves, and uh, it also is the hallmark of the world revolves around me, because it did. I'm an only child and an only grandchild, um, so you can imagine how I grew up thinking it really was all about me, um, and the the playground was my cellar, and I the bottles were my playthings, and I loved booze long before I ever drank it, um, and I had. Uh, I had an attitude long before I ever drank it too. Um, and I was uh, always from a young age and all through my drinking, uh, people were disposable for me. Just, you know, they were fine for now, but as soon as I walked out the door or got on a plane or went somewhere else, it was who's next, right? Who's next? I, I am not one of those people that has friends from grade school. Um, I don't, even, I don't even really have friends today from high school, except I went to my high school reunion. Um, and I hadn't seen them for over 20 years when I got there. Uh, so for me, personal relations were a little off um, from the gate, you know. Um, I'm also one of those uh, alcoholics who go um, in and out of jail and in and out of mental hospitals because everybody wants to fix me because everybody knows there's something wrong right? It's really pretty obvious when I drink that there's something wrong with Hilda, you know, and uh, it always makes me laugh when Mari Gallagher says, you know, there was something wrong when I was drinking, and I know because people would say, Mari, what's wrong with you, you know, and, and I always identify with that because I, I'm just like that, you know, and um, I'm a train wreck when I drink, you know, um, I have a long list of arrests um, for uh, indecent exposure, drunk driving, um, and uh, I'm one of those alcoholics that when you add alcohol, and, and I'm, I know I'm not alone in this because I've heard plenty of women share, but when you add alcohol to my type of alcoholic, for whatever reason, I just have to show you my tits. So you can imagine 
that some of my amends were a little on the uh, let's talk this through before we do anything, Hilda, right? Um, and, and of course, family. Um, I was, we were talking about this the other day, you know, I was thinking when I was drinking, um, I had an ocean between my mom and I. My mom was in the States um, and I was in Europe, all over Europe, um, all over really. And I did not for years send my mother a birthday card or a Christmas card, or a present, it just never dawned on me. You know, at the height of my drinking, I wasn't even sure it was the holidays half the time. You know, and somebody would say, oh, are you doing something for New Year's? I said, yes, is it New Year's? You know, I just didn't, it was just another day, another day of drinking. Um, you know, and, and and Clancy used to talk about that with holidays, you know, it's just Thursday, you know, or it's just Tuesday. It's not necessarily Christmas, it's just another day. Well, it was when I was drinking. It was just another day. And uh, I, um, my dad always knew exactly what I was. You know, um, I don't really get to talk about him a lot, but with eight and nine, I'm super excited that I do because um, my dad was a great guy. But he always knew what I was. You know, my dad, uh, I'm an only child, and my dad used to introduce me to people as his favorite daughter. He could take me anywhere twice, second time to apologize, you know. Um, so he was under no illusions what kind of what kind of daughter he had, you know. And uh, I was in Connecticut this time, and my dad was visiting, and um, I was, golly, I want to say maybe nineteen, and um, my company had a Christmas party, and it was an open bar, and I was drinking Black Russians because it was an open bar, and uh, I got absolutely legless. And my, my boss was mortified, mortified, because she had no idea I was drinking so much. And she had to call my father to come get me. And she could not stop apologizing. Now, my dad was a big guy. And that when he came in, my, my boss is like falling over herself, trying to explain how a 19-year-old got absolutely legless drunk. My dad just looked at her, and uh, he picked me up, and he threw me over his shoulder because he was a big guy. And he looked at my boss and he goes, don't worry. It's not the first time Hilda fought the Russians and lost, you know, because he knew, he knew exactly what kind of drunk I was, right? Um, I went, um, I was, I got done for drunk driving and I wasn't allowed to drive um, in the state of Nebraska. And I got done on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I was 17 at the time. And uh, I had to go to court and the judge kept saying to me, what were you doing drinking? The drinking age is 21. What were you doing drinking? And I said, well, it was St. Patrick's Day. And he goes, the drinking age is 21. You're 17. What were you doing drinking? And I'm looking at my lawyer and I'm going, well, it, it, it was St. Patrick's Day. And I could not understand why the, why the judge wasn't getting it. And in the end, my, my, my lawyer leaned over and just said, Hilda, please stop talking. You know, I just, <laughs> because I didn't get it. When I'm drinking, the rules don't apply to Hilda. Hilda's different, you know. And he told me not to, the judge told me not to leave the state. Not to leave the state. So I went on holiday to Greece. And I sent him postcards so that he'd know where I was. Because I wasn't showing up. Now, he could have easily sent me to jail. And when I got back and I went to see my parole officer. <laughs> and he had, the, he had the postcards posted up behind him. And, uh, and I said, um, he goes, so you went to Greece? I said, well, yeah, my dad sent me, you know, because when you're in, it sounds really a big deal when you're in America, but when you're in Europe, Greece is not that far. It's like going to Mexico. And um, I said, yeah, my, my, my dad sent me on holiday. And uh, he goes, but you weren't supposed to leave the state. I said, well, well, I, I know, but I was going on holiday. And he goes, he, you know, he's looking at the postcards and he's looking at me and why he didn't send me to jail, I think is because he knew there was truly no malice in me. I just didn't think the rules applied. I just didn't, you know, and he didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> and I think he knew going to jail was not another answer. It was just wasn't going to help. I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I was completely, our book describes it as full flight from reality. That's my drinking, full flight from reality. I, um, <laughs> my other half um, often says when, when she was drinking, she'd, um, when somebody would say something, she'd go, shh, 
don't spoil it. You know, it's like, I get it. I had no interest, you know, and it was funny because um, I was talking to somebody the other day that I used to work with years ago and uh, God love Facebook, right? People find you all over the place. And she, uh, she was talking about what a great listener I was. What a great listener Hilda is. You could tell Hilda anything, it goes to the grave. No, here's the problem. When you're talking to Hilda in the bar, Hilda's in blackout. She has no idea what you're talking about. So the next day when, when you're, you know, telling me how great you, you think it is that I'm so good of me to listen to you. I'm pretty sure in blackout, I'm listening to you because you're buying. You know, I have, there's no, I've got no depth like that when I'm drinking. <laughs> you know, it's like people are telling me their deepest, darkest secrets. And I'm in blackout and I'm like, oh, did we talk about that? You know, whatever. You know, I had a lot of, I did a lot of damage when I was drinking. Uh, not realizing that it was damage, you know, I just didn't know, I, w I was so, um, I don't know what the word is, you know, and um, I was engaged six times, uh, five rings, and uh, I, uh, I love that movie, The, the Runaway Bride, um, I have a little bit of that in my drinking, you know, I was, I went to, I was dating this guy for a very long time, um, Mike was his name, Mike Hoover, I've, tell you a little bit about those amends too but um we got engaged we're getting married the night before I'm supposed to go get married I wake up and I go wait his last name is Hoover I'm going to be Hilda Hoover oh no that's not going to work and I pawned the ring and I left town and that's that's what my drink is like and I didn't even think about him again for a decade a decade just disappeared completely gone and uh, that's sort of the downside of um, being a, a multinational you know I have three passports um, Irish English and American and you know when it all goes horribly wrong and you find out you're going to be Hilda Hoover it's handy to get out of town you know <laughs> just <laughs> gone and it's unfortunate because when I look back I think you know how um, how unthinking I guess um, I really was and and I'll be honest with you, that did not go away right away when I quit drinking. You know, it took me a long time to have any sort of empathy, I guess is the word. I think I was six and a half years sober before um, I really felt what you were feeling. You know, before that, people would share their hearts in Alcoholics Anonymous and they'd cry sitting next to me and I'd tap your knee, you know, sorry. I, I had no frame of reference. I had no idea where that was coming from. And nothing, absolutely nothing. And, um, and that's what was attractive to me for alcohol. That's what I loved about drinking is that I just got totally disconnected, totally in Hilda's world. And Hilda's world is good because they know me here, right? They have very low expectations of me. So when I, the first time I got sober was in um, New Year's Eve, 1989. And uh, I got sober because people were giving me a hard time about my drinking, you know, and my uncle had gotten sober. He tried to 12 me when I was 18 and, um, you know, it all went horribly wrong. And I thought about him and he was still sober and I thought I would give it a go. So I tried Alcoholics Anonymous, New Year's Eve, 1989 in Papillion, Nebraska. And uh, it was a really little meeting and they were talking about he's the father and we're the children. And I thought I was screwed because I know that's not the answer, right? I'm a seeker. So I, uh, I did a beeline for my car and this, um, this big dumb cowboy followed me out. And he said to me, uh, have you got a big book? I was like, of course I have a big book. Didn't everybody have a big book? Now, I wouldn't have known a big book if you'd beat me to death with it. But I couldn't tell him that, right? But without missing, his, missing a beat, he went to his truck and he gave me his big book. And it was the first time anybody had seen straight through me. And this little woman ran up to me and said, did you know if you go to a lot of meetings and you don't drink in between, you can't get drunk? I was like, thank you. I was like, these people are freaks. But I tell you what happened was, that woman's voice resonated in my head and I thought, hang on a minute, she may have a point here. If I go to a lot of these meetings and I don't drink in between, I might stay out of trouble. And that's what I did. 
went to a lot of meetings, did not drink in between, and my life took off. And Darren talked a little bit about it. I was a rocket to stardom in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? The jobs are getting better. The money's coming in. I mean, dry clean only clothes, right? Looking good, sounding good, but going five minutes late, leaving five minutes early and calling it a home group, right? I thought, Darren thought it was just a few of the steps for the really sick. I thought all the steps were for the really sick. And there seemed to be a lot of you. And really, you should be glad I'm here because you need me, right? So um, I, I got a sponsor because people were giving me a hard time about not having one, right? So I picked the oldest, frailest woman I could find because I thought she wouldn't give me a hard time. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't do that. But she tried. She really tried. And I think she was probably the closest thing I had to a higher power. And uh, she passed away when I was um, three years sober. And uh, when she passed away, I pulled away. You know, I went from seven meetings to five to four to three, two a week, two a month, because now I'm busy, right? And the, the truth is I sat in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous dying of alcoholism. And I didn't know. I didn't know. And uh, I actually... Um, was on my way to a job in Germany and I started drinking on a Thursday got uh, started my new job got to Germany on the Sunday started my new job on the Monday got done for drunk driving on the Friday and woke up in a wet bed next to my new boss on Saturday morning because that's my drinking right I'm a glamour drinker you know uh, I I Everybody has different motivations, I guess, for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I guess some of you actually wanted to stop drinking. I wanted to get out of wet beds with ugly people. I, I, that was really my motivation. Uh, I'll be totally honest with you. I didn't want to quit drinking. I just knew that that was the price of staying out of wet beds with ugly people. And uh, when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous um, on the 20th of July, 1993, I came willing you know, I came willing, um, you know, uh, I would have done anything that this uh, scary woman asked me to do because I didn't have a better plan, you know, and I tried doing everything different. You know, the meeting was all male apart from one other woman and she was a big American Indian and she terrified me. And, uh, you know, I, I, would, I shared my, my first meeting because they weren't letting me pass and afterwards, she said, um, you should make the tea and coffee. I was like, well, you know, this meeting was Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. I was like, I, I didn't know if I was going to be there on Thursday. You know, this was Tuesday night. It was a long time. And she just looked at me and said, you know, if you want to stay sober, you'll make it. Went, this woman, I, part of the reason I stayed sober, if we're all honest, is because I thought if I drank again, she would hunt me down like a dog. She terrified me, you know? And I was reading the book one night and uh, I don't know what I was reading. And it was about two in the morning, you know? Um, so I called her and she answered like she was waiting for it, right? It's creepy when they do that, right? So I'm, I'm Sandy, I don't know what I'm reading, but uh, I think I need a sponsor. Would you sponsor me? And she goes, I have been, but thanks for making it official. Click. And that's how I got my sponsor, right? And this woman, God love her. She, um, this is what I love about Zoom, right? I hadn't seen her for, golly, I don't know, maybe 16 years. And uh, I got a text one day, um, we're having a Zoom meeting and we'd like you to join us. And it was my spot, my first sponsor, her husband, her son, two of the women she sponsors and two of the men he sponsored. And it was like an old family reunion, you know, and that's the benefit of Zoom. But at the time, um, she just terrified me. And I was reading in her kitchen. She took me through the book line by line, page by page. And when there was an, um, an action, we took it, right? Pretty simple. It is not that complicated. But we're reading the book in her kitchen one day. And I said, um, I know what it says, Sandy, but do you know what it means? And before I could enlighten her, her big book came across the room and just missed me. And I was like, Jesus, Sandy, what are you doing? And she goes, no, when we read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, we read the black bits. There's nothing in between the lines. What they say is what they mean. 
And of course, I'm a mumbler, right? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I think there's more to it than that. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know how she didn't kill me, but she was good as gold. And um, so we're going through this book and we're going through these steps and um, I'm all on board, right? I'm in this little meeting, really small meeting. I don't know how many, I guess up in Bellingham, you might have some small meetings. Um, California, there's not a whole bunch of them. You got to look for them. But where I got sober, it was seven people in the room plus me. Um, and it seemed like everybody was on step four at the same time. And I was like, good for me. I mean, I'm not there. <laughs> so I'm kind of full of myself. I'm doing okay, you know. So uh, Sandy started, you know, helping me figure out how to um, make a decision in step three. And she's like, you know, when you make the decision, you don't get to take it back. You've made a decision. That means you're going to do four through 12. Uh, that's the decision. I was like, okay, we'll keep it simple. Now I am super practical. I am not a fluffy kind of, um, I don't know, pray it away kind of girl. I'm just not. I had to have a practical application of all of these steps because that's how my head works. I'm, I'm, I'm a geek. I'm a techie. I, I can't do fluffy. Um, and Sandy knew that and she was good as gold with it. Um, so when we were, um, we were doing six and seven and you know, I know you can't work on six and seven, but what Sandy told me was there's no point in doing eight and nine if you haven't changed enough to make a difference. Otherwise, you're just Hilda, I'm sorry, Fontana, which is what I was drinking. I was always sorry. I was always sorry. And I was always wanting to make it right. You know, I, but I just, it just didn't matter because I would just do it again. Right? And then I'd apologize, and then I'd do it again. Then I'd apologize. I mean, it means nothing. So when I was going into these um, steps eight and nine, I was like, what difference is it going to make? Right? What difference is it going to make? And Sandy said, you know, if you really, you really apply step six and seven in your life, you will no longer have the excuse I've always been and I'm always going to be. I've always been a loser. I'm always going to be, I've always been a bitch. I'm always going to be, you don't get to have that excuse because six and seven is where you get to change. And the way we do that, you're right. We don't work on them, but we certainly can practice the opposite behavior. You can't think yourself into right action, but you can act yourself into right thinking and practicing the opposite. So we got my little list of defects and in six, I become willing and in seven, I start practicing the opposite behaviors, you know? So like, apologizing to people, <laughs> you know, maybe not insulting them in the first place, you know, and, and when I finally got to a place and, and page 78 and the 12 and 12, I'm not a huge 12 and 12 fan. I will put that out there. Um, I'm a big book girl, um, but there are a few steps that I think the 12 and 12 is super helpful. Um, eight is one of them, six and seven are the other two. <laughs> um, because in 78, right before it goes into step eight, it says, the seventh step is where we make the change in our attitude, which permits us with humility as our guide to move out from ourselves towards others and towards God. That means I have to change enough to make it make a difference. You know, I don't, I don't just get to go out there and, and start trying to make it all right. I did do that though with my ex, I will admit. Um, I wasn't anywhere near steps eight and nine, um, but my ex was living in Luxembourg and I was living in Germany and that's, it's only about an hour and a half away. And uh, she had invited me for Christmas. My parents were going to be away. They hated me. So my parents out of town, I get to go. Um, and I, I tell my sponsor, I'm going to go make amends while I'm there. And she goes, uh, you know, there's a few steps before you get to that point. And no, 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 it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine, right? We're, we're just going to have a platonic little holiday. I'm going to make it all right, and it'll be good. And Sandy goes, let me know how that goes. Because <laughs> I hadn't changed. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't even taken an inventory at this point to know that I had done some damage. So I go down and it goes horribly wrong. And I am driving home, pulling over to throw up from being so emotionally upset, right? Because it went horribly wrong and I didn't see it coming. And of course, the worst part is now I have to tell my sponsor she was right. Right. Now I have to tell her she was right. I was wrong. And now let's get to a fit spiritual condition to do eight and nine. How about that? Right. 
And, and that's what I love about eight and nine. You know, this is the part in the book, um, top of page 77, which really turned everything around for me, right? Because it says our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Thank you. I needed that. You know, I needed a practical application. Oh, okay. I need to go try and be of service, fit myself to be of service. Most excellent, you know. So I was working when I got sober. I was working on a, a base, a NATO base in Germany. And um, I had gotten, when I had gotten done for drunk driving that time, it was at the front gate with this little NATO guy. And uh, when I got sober, I'm finally up to steps eight and nine. And uh, I had been banned from driving on the base. So I used to have to park in visitor parking and walk all the way to my building. <laughs> Rain, sleet, snow, you name it, right? So um, I got my license back. I was about, uh, I don't know, maybe nine months sober, coming up on a year. Um, and I'm, I'm in the depths of eight and nine. And my sponsor says to me, here's an easy one. Why don't you make amends to the little fella on the gate that you tormented who wrote you up for drunk driving? Why don't, why don't you go try him first? And I was like, why? He was such a dork. She goes, no, no. And here's what she really wanted me to make amends for. When I got my license back about a month before I was told to go make amends, when I got my license back, I drove in the gate and he had to come and salute and come to attention. I did a U-turn, went back around, and went back through the gate and made him do it again. But I did it 10 times just to annoy him to death because that's how I roll, right? <laughs> so now she wants me to go make amends to this guy for being such an ass. <laughs> so I, I'm in the only way I could do this, right? We made three lists, my eight lists. One was got to do right now, got to do super soon and got to do in God's time, right? And of course, um, anybody I sponsor will tell you, I do exactly what my sponsor did and start with the God's time because those are the ones I really don't want to do, right? <laughs> so I make these lists and then like this little fella on the gate, we do these little index cards where I get to put his name, what I'm making amends for, and then at the bottom, what I'm actually going to say because Sandy wants to hear what I'm going to say so that I don't make it up on the spot and start with, well, if you hadn't been such a dick, I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Which is what Hilda really wants to do. But what Sandy wants Hilda to do is to do it in a way that allows me to get to the point where I get to ask him, how can I make it right? right? That's where I need to get to. Hilda on her own devices is probably not gonna get there right away. you know. And then, um, which it all went pretty well. He thought I was crazy. Thought I was crazy before he thought I was crazy after he had no idea what this was all about but he took it and we got on quite well after that um the other thing that happened to me when I got sober was my um boss at NATO absolutely hated me hated me took any opportunity she could to um have a go at me and uh you know I didn't know she knew I was drinking Right. I don't know if anybody else had that experience. I didn't know anybody knew I was drinking. I mean, I'm such a train wreck when I drink, really, like you wouldn't know. But I didn't know she knew. But what happened was um, I got sober. And two weeks later, I was brought up to a tribunal to lose my security clearance, which is my job. Right. I mean, nobody should have ever given me security clearance. But that's a whole different story. But um, now I'm going before a tribunal and this woman is standing up talking about what a train wreck I am. And the fact that I'm a drunk makes me a security risk, which is true. I mean, that's what they tell you. If you're, if you're in blackout, you could tell people anything. Right? <laughs> so I don't understand why I'm at a tribunal because I quit drinking now. Why, why, is, why isn't everybody just happy I'm not drinking? Why do I have to go through a whole tribunal and everything? So my boss stood up for me and made a case for me to keep my security clearance um, and my job. And um, my big boss was annoyed to death. She wanted me gone, 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 gone. And she was not quiet about it. So um, Sandy said to me, we need to go make direct amends to her. 
And I was like, no, I can't do it. And she goes, well, why don't you pay, pray for the willingness to do it, right? And I was like, uh, no, nope, anybody, let's move on. Who's next, <laughs> right? She goes, no, we're going to do it. She said, why don't you pray for her? Um, you know, I think it's, I don't know what page it is in the in the fourth edition, but I know in the third edition, it's on 449, it talks about, you know, praying for somebody else and all of that. So I, I prayed for her and I started with, I hope that slimy, horrible woman gets everything she deserves, you know, and I finally got to the point where I was praying for her to get what God thinks she deserves, which in my humble world is like, if he thinks she needs a flat tire, good on him, you know, uh, if she doesn't, whatever. So I reached the point where I could finally go make amends to this woman, you know, and I write it all out with Sandy and we make it, you know, so that I get to get to the point where I ask, how do I make it right? And uh, I, go to, I go to do these amends with her and she reluctantly gives me an appointment. And uh, I sit down and I, you know, and I tell her I'm trying to, trying to turn my life around. And, you know, I have a, a spiritual uh, program and, you know, I go through the whole thing. And at the end, I say, you know, I know I was a terrible employee, probably your worst for a while. Um, how can I make it right? And she looked at me and she goes, I'd like you to leave the base get another job. And I was like, anything else? <laughs> she was not going to let me off the hook. She was not impressed. She didn't care. She didn't care about the amends. She still was after me the whole rest of the time I worked there. Um, but here's the deal. I had made an honest effort. I had truly tried to make it right. You know, my side of the street, as they say, um, was good. And that was the best it was going to get. You know, I kept telling um, my sponsor, yeah, but how do I get her to forgive me? And she goes, oh, wait, that's not the point. The point is not to get her to forgive you. That makes it all about you again. The point is you make amends, you clear your side of the street, whether she accepts it or not, and then you get to act differently so that you don't have to make these amends again, right? She said, in fact, restraint of pen and tongue and send button in today's day and age is all about not having to go back and make amends to people you really don't want to make amends to, right? It's like, think twice before it comes out of your mouth, before you have to go make amends to the, you know, 16-year-old working in the grocery store who you've just abused. Do you really want to go back and make amends to him? Hmm, probably not, right? Restraint of pen and tongue. So <clears throat> she was... So her and the guy in the gate were my first ones and both went not great. And I had heard people and I read in the book about, you know, years of things fall from us and, you know, everything's good. And I hadn't had any of that yet. <laughs> you know, None of my amends went well. Nobody wanted to forgive me, despite the fact that I really was trying to change. And finally, um, I had to write a letter to my ex who told me never to show up again. So um, my sponsor said, you don't show up again. You don't get to show up on her doorstep because you're making amends, because now you're ready to make amends. Uh, they told you never to show up again. You don't show up again. You write her a letter, an honest letter, and you do the best you can with it. And you don't put a return address on it so that they don't feel the need to write you back. You just get to write the letter and pray that God gets gets them some sort of closure for them so I did that and um I didn't think it worked I didn't even know they got it right I wrote it to one to her and one to her parents and then a few years back and this is where I think God has a sense of humor a few years back on Facebook I get this little message from my ex who says oh are you coming up to um Canada or something and um i can't remember where it was there's this tiny little place in, uh, south of vancouver that has this roundup every year that i was talking at and it was in this um like recreation hall and my ex was working in that recreation hall with kids and saw the flyer and it said hilda f so she found me on facebook to ask me if that was me going and i was like um well yeah she goes, oh, I actually live here. How about coffee? 
I was like, well, what? <laughs> okay. So I call my sponsor. I'm like, what do I do with this? And she goes, this is where God says, now you get to make direct events. I was like, huh. So I got to go to coffee with her. I mean, this is decades later. I had to go for coffee with her and, and really make proper amends. And here's my favorite part of all of that. The first words out of her mouth were, oh my God, you look great. This AA must be working for you. I thought, how cool is that? Right? How cool is that? And we're good now. We, we are good. I, it's amazing. I never thought that would happen, you know. And um, there are some amends my sponsor told me I shouldn't be doing. Even though I owe them, but I shouldn't be doing it. So I was dating a Coke dealer um, years ago. And when he finally passed out, you know, five or six days of not sleeping, when he finally passed out, he was a gun collector. He collected all these different guns. When he finally passed out, I loaded all the guns in the boot of my car. We were in Connecticut. And I drove to Harlem to a bar I used to drink in because they would take my bad checks. And I asked the bartender if he wanted to buy them. So I sold all this guy's guns and then went back to the house, got into bed and woke up with him, shocked that somebody had robbed him. Now, my sponsor said, those aren't the kind of men you go uh, make directly. Uh, that's called leading with the chin, our literature says, <laughs> right? And, um, and he was still, still dealing. Um, so I did write him a card uh, to say, oh, by the way, that was me. And, um, you know, obviously weren't in our right minds. <laughs> but, um, you know, there are some that we probably shouldn't do. Um, and I, I worked very hard with my sponsor on identifying the real ones that I shouldn't and the real ones that I absolutely must. And, um, you know, I was uh, talking about my dad earlier. And um, now, I have never been a believer in graveside amends. Never. I, I thought it was podium talk, right? I heard people talk about graveside amends. And I was like, it's just not, it's not real. It's not something, right? Now, my dad's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And when he died, um, I was really at the peak of my drinking. And um, I was there apparently, um, and I embarrassed the whole family and I was an embarrassment and I was just all bad. So years later, I think I was, golly, I don't know, maybe 16 years sober. I was going to Washington DC for work. And my sponsor said, hey, I think this is a brilliant time for you to go make graveside amends for your dad. And I was like, sure whatever graveside amends she goes no really I think now is the time so when he died I didn't know Arlington was this um, tourist attraction and I didn't know that if you didn't have one of these um, family passes that um, you couldn't drive in that you had to take a little bus around now when he died drunk 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 they gave me this this piece of paper um, and I've been all over the world drunk and sober when I was going to Washington, D.C., I put my hand straight on it decades later. And, and I'm not quite sure how that happens, except for a little bit of God. And we go to Washington, D.C., and I rent a car, and I put it in the dash. And as we drive into Arlington National Cemetery, the guards at the gate come to attention and salute. And I didn't know it was going to happen. And it really caught me off guard. And uh, I drove straight to my dad's grave which I'm not quite sure how that happens either because I was so drunk when I buried him. And yet, I don't know if you've been to Arlington, but it is a maze of white um, headstones. But I drove straight to my dad's. And you know, I was at my dad's graveside and I was doing me graveside amends. And I realized something. I had a moment where I realized that my dad would be proud of me today. Not because I've been sober this long, not because I've been in a healthy relationship this long, not because I've been of service, not, not because of anything except my dad only ever wanted me to have a little bit of grace and dignity. That's all. He just wanted to be happy and a little bit of grace and dignity. And I got that here in Alcoholics Anonymous watching you. The women in Alcoholics Anonymous helped me realize how to do that. You know, my sponsor, 
you know, people like Paula, with Polly and Carla and, you know, people who really live that. And I learned how to do that. When I was doing graveside amends with my dad, I actually felt it. And I didn't know that was going to happen. And I am a great believer now. You know, I, I would have never done it if my sponsor hadn't suggested it. But it was a way to finally say my amends to my dad. I was daddy's girl anyway, you know, make my amends right there. And I knew that it meant something. I knew that it meant something because it was wholehearted and I really meant it when I did it. And um, so we're trying to get through these amends and, um, you know, it's, it's somewhere in our book that says, you know, it's, it's one of these that are going to take a very long time. It's a lifetime effort. Um, and, and I believe that, um, especially with my mom. Um, and some, some of you have heard me share about my mom. Um, I tormented my mother when I was drinking. I'm an only child. You know, I got arrested in um, Israel and I called my mother collect, collect and she could do nothing. She didn't even know where to start, you know. Um, now, my sponsor says, if you're sitting here with us today, there are 10 people sleeping better, 10 people digesting their dinner better because you're here with us. And I have to tell you, my mom is one of the 10, right? So when I got sober, I said to my sponsor, um, how do I make amends to this woman? My mom. I mean, how do you make amends for that? And she said, you know, it's going to be God's time, not yours. And when the time is right, you'll know. Now, I made my initial amends, of course, um, but the lifetime ones were the difficult, where, you know, how do you know? How do you know you're doing well? How do you know you're doing it right? How do you know it's enough? When is it enough? And I didn't know any of that. And my sponsor kept saying, have a little faith. God will let you know, you know. When I was six and a half years sober, my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. And I was living in England, and um, she asked me to go out to Southern California when she had these big operations. Now, I had started calling my mom every week, right? Just trying to, to make some sort of connection with her, just calling her every week. So when she got this diagnosis, she called me and asked me to go out. And I said I would. And uh, six and a half years sober, I go out to Southern California. She was in Huntington Hospital and the old 202 club was right across the street. So while she was asleep, I ran across to the meeting and they were so good to me in the meeting. And I made sure I was there when she woke up and um, really, really tried to, to be there for my mom. And I had gone back to university and was doing something that I never should have been doing, but it was in the helping people realm. Um, which is not what I do today. Two and a half years sober, it seemed like a really good idea. Six and a half years sober, I was still at university, but oddly enough, and they say, is it odd or is it God, right? Oddly enough, because of what I had been doing at university, they let me take my mom home early and nurse her at home. And I was emptying her tubes one day and my mom just turned to me and said, I don't know how I'm ever gonna repay you. And I said, wow, you don't get it. Six and a half years, I had waited for that moment when I got to be the daughter she deserved instead of the one she had. And my mom and I have a great relationship today, right? We, um, <laughs> we've had a good few years. Um, and, you know, I, I took her back to Ireland as part of my amends, you know, to where she grew up. And um, when, we were, when I was taking her, my sponsor kept saying, just remember, this is your mother's trip. I was like, yeah, I know. She goes, no, really, Hilda. I said, yeah, all right. So I take my mom to Ireland and uh, she shows me where she went to school and where she bought her sweets and, you know, where she, whatever. And I was just wanted to kill myself. And uh, I remember that it was my mother's trip. And you reminded me when I went to a meeting that it was my mother's trip. And we were on Bray Mountain one day and we're overlooking where um, she played on the beach. And my mom just turned to me and said, you know, you've turned into a lovely young woman. My mom. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what these amends are all about, right? To really give her the daughter she deserved, you know? And, uh, and I'm glad that I have put all this um, conscious effort into really being a daughter for her because we thought she was just um, a little forgetful. And now we found out it's way worse than that. <laughs>
I get to be a daughter again, you know. This time, I didn't have, I didn't have to have anybody give me a hint that maybe I should be, right? This time I just did because I have been playing daughter now, you know, now I know what a daughter is supposed to look like. And um, I'm actually working in uh, Georgia every other week or whatever. And I got a call on Thursday from the police because they had stopped my mother. She uh, was driving erratically and they called me and said, you're gonna have to come get her. She's not, she's not fit to be driving. And I was in Georgia. So I, you know, I called my wife who's three months longer sober than me and she will tell you so. Um, and I said, you know, can you go get my mom, whatever. And, you know, we took care of it or whatever. And um, I got home on Saturday and I went from the airport to my mom's house. And uh, I said to her, what's going on? You know, what happened? And she goes, you know, she got a little disoriented and I don't know. And, you know, we made an appointment with the doctor and, and my mom couldn't stop apologizing you know, that the police had to be called, you know. And I said to her, um, we're not even close to balancing the scales here. How many times did the police call you on me? How many times did you lose sleep over what was going on with Hilda? How many times did you come and get me out of jail? She goes, oh, I know, but you're not supposed to be doing it for me. <laughs> I said, we got a long way to go before, before you owe me anything, you know. And it's brilliant because, you know, now she's, she's coming around to, to admitting it, you know, but I get to be there for her, you know, and I love, I love it when her neighbor says, um, you know, um, I hope you don't mind me calling you because, you know, your mother gets worried that she doesn't want to worry you. And I said, you know, now's the time. She's supposed to be. This is full circle, right? This is now my time. This is when I get to do it, you know? And um, we're taking it as it comes really. Um, and we'll see where we go, you know? Um, I, as an only child, there's, you know, there's really no, no option. It's not like I got somebody else who can do it, you know? And one of the things I truly love in um, the big book, it's on page 85, and it talks about, um, with the amends, it's about timing, courage, and prudence. Timing, courage, and prudence. You know, I didn't think I was doing enough when I started doing these amends with my mom. You know, I never felt like it was enough with my dad. And slowly, as time is going on, and I realized that, you know, it, it's all coming through because I was willing to do it. You know, because I was willing to do it. And of course, the thing with the promises that um, some people miss um, because they're taken out of context um, is when somebody reads in a meeting, uh, the promises on page, the bottom of page 83, it says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. Halfway through what? Well, it, it's, it's in steps eight and nine. It's halfway through my amends. That's what they're talking about. If we're half, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. We'll know a new freedom and a new happiness. We'll not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Comprehend the word serenity and we'll know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, hello, we will see how our experience can benefit others. The feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We'll lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows, like my mom. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. The fear of economic insecurity, by the way. It doesn't mean you won't be poor. That was pointed out to me. Um, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us and will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what he could not do for, us, for ourselves. Are these extravagant prom promises? We think not. They're being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, and they always work materialize if we work for them they're in eight nine it's right off to that that it says this thought brings us to step 10 so i get to be amazed before i'm halfway through and then this thought brings us to step 10 i mean how brilliant is that how brilliant is that you know the whole thing with eight and nine for me has always come down to motives what are my motives for making amends, right? 
am I doing it because I want to get back in bed? <laughs> am I doing it because I want to pay all, you know, or so that I can get out of paying money back? You know, I owed a lot of money when I got sober um, because some bright spark in my um, AA meeting told me that um, if I'm sober, now I have to be responsible. And I had never paid taxes in my life. I had never paid taxes and I got sober, I was 28. And this little bright spark in my meeting said, you know, you really need to, um, if you're gonna be a useful member of society, you need to file your taxes. So this is where I tell you, you should run these things by your sponsor, even if you hear some little bright spark sell it in a meeting, right? I didn't, I filed my taxes and I got a bill from the tax man. $69,000. <laughs> I said to my sponsor, I got a bill for 69. They want $69,000. I'm not going to give them that much of my money. She goes, no, it's their money and they want it and you didn't pay it. And I was like, oh, that's not going to work. She goes, but here's the deal, deal Hilda. There's a guy in AA in Brussels um, who's an accountant for expatriates. Go talk to him, take all your, you know, your receipts and everything you got and um, go through it all with him, but be honest with him. Be honest with him. All right. I was like, fine. So I go talk to this accountant guy and he starts going through the thing and he's like, wow, $69,000. It's not the highest I've seen, but it's pretty good. Pretty good. I was like, whatever, because this guy works with expatriates in AA. And um, so finally we go through it all. It took a couple of years. And um, in the end, the IRS owed me money, $6, right? So this is what, how much of an arsehole I am. I said to my sponsor, do you think they'll give it to me? She goes, are you kidding me? Take it as a win, right? But here's the thing about the amends. I was willing, I was willing to find a way if they really wanted it. I truly was. I had no idea I was going to get out of paying it. But I was willing to pay it back. And um, I, had a, I had a few things like um, when I was in, I don't know, high school, I worked for this clothing place. And um, I would write returns for cash for people who never brought stuff back. Um, then I was taking the cash, basically. I was robbing the store blind. And uh, I told my sponsor about it. And she said, you know, you have to make financial amends for this. And I said, um, yeah, but the store is long closed and gone. Nothing to do with me. I mean, it was 30 years ago. And she goes, I know, but we need to find a way for you to make amends. It was a clothing store, right? I said, well, yeah. She goes, okay, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to go some, buy some new business clothes in a few different sizes. And I want you to take it down to the women's recovery house. And I want you to do that for a few months, maybe for a year, once a month for a year, until you feel like maybe you came close to paying that money back. And you get to do a little good at the same time. And I was like, sure. Yeah, right, we'll do that, okay. She goes, but here's the kicker, Hilda. You don't get to tell them it's from you. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> she goes, nope. You get to put them, put them in their um, original packaging that you got from the store. You get to take them over, you get to put them in the office and you get to leave while they're all at lunch. Nobody gets to know that that's what you've been doing because these are amends that you get to make. And I don't want you getting a pat on the back for them. And I was like, huh, pretty sure that's not how this is supposed to work <laughs> when I did it. I did it for about 18 months actually. Um, and it was a killer because I was in a meeting one night and this woman was sharing about, you know, somebody used to donate these brand new clothes to my recovery home. And that's what I wore to go take a, a job interview in. And I was desperate to say, that was me, I did that. <laughs> and I didn't, I was like, wow, that's cool. Good for you. You know, I hope you got the job. Um, you know, it's, it's that thing where, um, you know, step seven talks about having the humility, right? Having the humility to go out and do these amends. You know, being able to kind of put my hand up to say what a complete arsehole I was. 
but then trying to not be one from then on, right? That's, that's the whole point, I think. And when I, um, when I was saying to my, my sponsor, how do I know when I'm kind of, kind of done with this list, the, you know, from my four and five, my eight list, is that how do I know when I'm done really writing the, the eight list to, to go out and make these amends? She goes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about people in your life while you were drinking and even in early sobriety, because I owed some people in early sobriety. She goes, if you saw them on the other side, if you saw them coming at you down the street on the sidewalk, would you feel like you have to cross the street and avoid them? Huh. And I thought about some people and I wasn't quite sure how much amends I owed them, but I absolutely would have crossed the street if I saw them coming down and hoped they hadn't seen me. And they went on the list. And they're the ones that, you know, it was kind of, um, I think it talks about in our book, um, they probably didn't even know that I had a resentment, but I still need to make it right. You know, I still need to make it right. And the, I don't think, I don't think my eight and nine are, are ever really going to be done. Like, I know for sure they're not going to be with my mother. Um, but I, I really hold on to what it says on page 83, where it talks about a spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. We have to live it. That means I have to be cognizant of how I'm treating people, right? I have to remember on page 77 that my purpose is to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. And it's funny because my sponsor is very big on that, um, in fact, our, our retreat is called the force for good, you know, which is a really good way to, for me to remember what I'm supposed to be doing on a daily basis, you know, and, and all of these um, amends. And, and if you're new and you're thinking, I'm not doing it, I am totally with you on that. It is not an easy thing to think about when you're new, but just know that there's um, seven steps before eight and nine. And I truly believe that they all build on each other, that by the time I really got to eight, I was ready to do them properly. But I would highly recommend that you don't jump from one to eight, or one to nine even, um, and just tear out and start trying to make it all better. Because um, that didn't go very well for me. <laughs> but the exciting thing for me with um, eight and nine, now that I'm finishing, um, <laughs> is that um, I think Marty's going to do uh, 10, um, which who I absolutely adore, 10, 11. And, uh, and of course, Polly is doing 12, which is fantastic. Polly, I can't wait to hear you. Um, and I, I'm really glad I got a chance to go over um, eight and nine. It's not usually one of the, it's not usually the steps that I share a lot on. Um, I normally get, get nailed for either three or six and seven for some odd reason in life. Um, but it was nice. It was nice to be able to, to really think through my experience with eight and nine and um, get ready to listen to 10. Um, and I'm delighted that I get to download all the speakers from yesterday. I'm looking forward to that. So thank you again for asking me. I'm delighted I got to share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.